Oh, that was a teaser. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live event for August. I cannot believe it is August already. I still am trying to get past the fact that Memorial Day is gone. <laughs> but anyway, my name is Dave Solberg. I'm your host of the RV Lifestyle and Repair Club, our live event for tonight. And we've had uh, quite a bit happening here in the last few weeks. We're going to shoot uh, in two weeks. In fact, uh, I am actually going to the Raleigh show next Wednesday. And we have uh, seminars that are Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So if you're anywhere near the Raleigh area, uh, stop in and, and join us. We've got 17 different seminars. You can go to the North Carolina RV Dealers Association website and see the schedule there. So uh, even if you own an RV already, there are seminars for you on maintenance and upgrades and boondocking and all kinds of fun stuff. It's not just buyer seminars. So there's a, a lot at the show. So we'll get started. We got quite a few already on. We got 24 viewers waiting for us. And the first one is from Paul White. He says he's looking to buy a 1989 Class A motorhome that has 33,000 uh, kilometers on it. So Paul must be up in Canada or over in England. Uh, where can I get it certified for brakes, tires, mechanical, etc.? And if it's a 1989, it could be either a work, uh, excuse me, a Chevrolet P30 chassis or uh, the Ford. Ford came out in 1988 uh, for the 89 model year. So it could possibly be the Ford on the F53. And really, <clears throat> you know, no, no RV dealers were allowed to work on the chassis. So I don't think you're going to find an RV dealership that would be able to do that. But that uh, those chassis were both utilized originally for delivery truck, uh, lumber yard, that type of stuff, chassis. So uh, you can get just about any uh, truck center that, that specializes in Chevrolet or Ford should be able to take those in because they're a pretty standard brake system um, on, on that unit. So again, I, I'm not sure what part of the country you're in, but you should be able to find one. Um, I know Ford put out a manual. You might want to look if, if it uh, still has its big owner's binder, Ford would have put a manual in where their authorized chassis centers were at. And you might still, uh, might have one that's still in business uh, from 1989. So uh, Peyton Hawks uh, says, I have a 2023 Cougar, uh, 23 MLE that is nearly new obviously we're still in 23 although the 24s are already out they've been out for almost three four months now it's like wow these guys get a big jump on things so upon returning from a recent trip the usual rough roads you must live in iowa i discovered that the kitchen sink had come dislodged from its uh, underhung moorings and fallen in what glue is best to repair it so it will not fall again and uh, normally the sink so you're talking about the kitchen sink, um, you know, most of those in the Cougar, I'm not really sure, but um, you either have a double stainless steel sink or you have a uh, plastic Corian solid surface, uh, something, something to that effect. And so if it's underhung, I, I would imagine it's probably the Corian style with that. And uh, with those, you definitely want to get some type of a solid surface adhesive. And I would go to a Florida ceiling store, um, anybody that specializes in Corian, you can try the Home Depots and some of the home improvement stores, but I found that a lot of the people in them in there refer out to specialists in that. So you got to get a special type of glue. And the other thing I would probably recommend is if there is a way to uh, build an undercarriage into that, just get uh, you know a, a, a strapping piece that you can go underneath and just help support the weight of that, that sink because you're gonna get a lot of banging going around. And you know, that, that's one of the problems with RVs is everybody wants the same stuff you have in your house. You know, and they want the solid surface, they want tile, they want you know, all the stuff that you have in your home that never goes down the road, never changes temperature. And we put it in an RV and we see tile that starts to buckle up, the grout won't hold, the chassis twists. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we keep seeing people want the, in the RVs and it's like, man, it's just, you're asking for trouble. So uh, with the Corian one, you know, in the underslung, yeah, they look nice, but um, you know, that, that is a fairly common thing when you, when you take it down the road a lot. 
So like I said, I would, I would find a specialist that does solid surface and not only use the adhesive, but, you know, see if there's some way you can support that weight. Cause that's, that's a heavy sink. Um, then the next one we have, uh, N Bouillard and he says he's got a Jayco 2018, uh, 21, two QB and there's no, Oh, he's okay. The second question down. Uh, our furnace stopped working again. Last time it was a dirty sail switch. This time it turns on and it blows. The blower goes on, but blows cold air. Is it the sail switch again? Last time it would try to start, but wouldn't ignite uh, the blower. So this time is different. Um, gas is on uh, as the hot water tank works. Okay, so the way a furnace works, and I'm going to bring this one up here so you can see what you did or what somebody fixed. There we go. So this is a typical uh, furnace that we, we've taken out of a unit. And this would be not the direct style, but more of a vented one. And I'm not sure which, which model you have, but they both work fairly much the same. When your thermostat is set and it calls for heat, it's going to send a 12-volt signal down into your module board over on the side over here. That's going to start up your motor here. And what that does is it, it exhausts anything that is in the burner chamber. So it's going to come through and exhaust out in here. It's going to pull in interior air and that interior air then is going to go over the top of this and you can see here it's going to um, blow it over the at the top of this but what it's doing then is it is lifting this sail switch right here and what that's saying is i have enough airflow i have enough air pressure going in there that yeah go ahead and light so now the first one you said um it was a dirty sail switch. So I, I, I don't know necessarily if the, the, you know if it's a dirty sail switch, it's very possible if it gets a bunch of stuff on it, if it's too heavy to actually rise up, I would say it was probably more a, a defective sail switch or the, the burner that wasn't blowing fast enough. Um, it, so then it says it's sail switch again, last time it would try to start, but wouldn't engage the blower. So here's the, how the rest of the system works. Once this fan gets spinning and you get enough air fast enough to lift this sail switch, then it's going to open the gas valve and that gas valve is going to have up here, this igniter is going to try and, and start. So if you hear a click, 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 then you know that the sail switch is okay, but it's something in here that is, is not lighting. You're either not getting um, enough of gas flow in it. The igniter is not good. It's got a crack in the inside of it. Um, you know, so there's a variety of different things that will do that. If it, and if it's not like it will, it will only try to light so many times. And uh, then it will go into a default for a while and it will try it again. I think it does that three, three different cycles. So one of the biggest culprits in a gremlin type system working is your batteries. So that's the first thing I always ask when when it's not lighting um, and it, just a fan blower is going, are you plugged into 120 volt power? Because if you're not, your batteries could be sulfated enough that they're just not able to keep up with all the other stuff, the lights and everything you've got going on. And it will run this fan, but it won't run it fast enough. That's the other thing I've seen too, where sometimes it starts the fan, the sail switch says, yep, I've got enough. Then it tries to light and something else kicks on inside and all of a sudden the batteries go down and then it just goes down and, and it won't light. So the very first thing I always tell everybody is check that you got 12.6 volts coming to this. If you're plugged into an electrical source, your converter in your distribution center, or if you have a standalone like this WIFCO one here, it will automatically do 13.2 volts all the time. It'll do 13.6 when your batteries are low, but it, you know, it'll drop down to 13.2 as a maintenance. That way, you know, you're getting enough. So if, if you're having trouble and you're just, you're boondocking, that's the very first thing I do is I check the 12 volt to the system, maybe get a battery booster, one of those little portable, uh, um, 
oh, what are they, lithium small packs that you can put in there and just give it that boost and say, is this what's happening? And that's how they would start to troubleshoot it. So the second thing that I would look at is, is this sales switch actually working? Um, check all your vents inside. If you've got rugs over top of the vents, that's going to block that airflow and it's going to push back in here. Now, usually what happens when they're blocked, it'll start up, but because the air can't get out here, the temperature gets so hot in this area that this temp switch back here will shut it down. But the temp switch very seldom will ever keep it from lighting. Um, it, it's normally going to try to light before that. The other thing, if you hear a click inside, then you know you you might be to the point where your your spark igniter here and this whole burner assembly in here is is corroded so bad. Um, you got to take it out then and get and get into those. But check your batteries. Um, you know, if if it's the sail switch, then it will not try to spark. And so you know. If you can get in there and get at that, that's a pretty easy fix. If they just cleaned it, then I would say you probably, they, they, didn't, they didn't fix it. So like I say, a dirty sail switch is not a very common issue. All right, um, Eric then says, 2013 Jayco Greyhawk 31D with less than 20,000 miles. Do you think extended warranty plans are worth the cost? If so, which provider is top rated? Uh, while I know roadside assistance coverage are different than extended warranty coverage, I have not had good experience with good Sam. Imagine that. The one time I needed them, they did not come through. Uh, wanting to think there's better service out there, and there is, there is. So the difference between roadside assistance is they're gonna take care of tires, you run out of gas, uh, they'll, they'll tow you to a place that, you know, if you have a, a breakdown, but that's about, you know, that, that, that's the extent of it. The extended warranty is going to be like, your, you know, stuff breaks down with a refrigerator. That's not covered by roadside assistance. That's not an emergency that you're at. In my opinion, the best one out there is CoachNet. CoachNet has been in the business for over 40 years. I remember starting with them when I was at Winnebago. We, we put a brand new CoachNet. Uh, they didn't have extended warranties at that time. They had roadside assistance and technical service, and it was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was the most fantastic program we could put on those units. We didn't have to staff a department. They were very, very knowledgeable. All their, um, all their guys are RVIA, RV, RVTI, which is RVIA's technical training, um, certified as well as the OEMs, which is Lippert and Norcold and Dometic, um, and they're fantastic. Now, just last winter, uh, I was doing seminars at Tampa, and we talked about the different programs, uh, their extended warranty. And one of the one of the questions I get a lot is, I have X Y Z, like your extended warranty, and I called and I waited 24 hours to to get there. Um, I couldn't get service for six months. Um, you know, the thing I like about CoachNet is they have over 800 service locations that they are working with and 800, you know, some, somewhere close to that of towing experts that know how to tow your vehicle. You know, you don't want, don't want just anybody hooking up and towing you wherever you want to go. They, they know the points where they can hook up, the points they can't hook up. They don't rip the front end or the back end of your RV off and, and they know what they're doing. And they said that the the, the longest time they've ever had to have somebody wait to get service work done is about a week. And with the supply chain shortage and the service issues we've had out in the market, that is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So I am a huge, huge fan of CoachNet. I know the people there. They, uh, they know their stuff and they take care of you. So I got a, I got a CoachNet tattoo somewhere in <laughs> no. It's just, you know, when you find somebody that does a good job for so many years, uh, you know, I'm passionate about it. I really am. And there's not a lot of good ones out there today because the market is so filled. There's so many RVs out there. And if you have a problem with this one, they don't care. They're, they're churning more and more people all the time. They're just, they're just looking at raking in. And the other thing that happens is when the market goes up in the RV industry, all these outside companies jump in that are all of a sudden experts. You know, wow, we, we, we do, we've been done roofing for six months. It's like, really? So uh, I like the people that have been through 
the good times, through the bad times, and have helped people through all of them. So with that, coach net. Uh, Pat says, Winnebago Voyage 2006, and the front air conditioner occasionally starts, then stops. Then after a minute or so, it starts again. Back air conditioner works just fine. I did have a repair at the facility, a burned out capacitor. Now, most of the time it works fine. If I turn off all the other electrical draw, uh, like the water heater, microwave, toaster oven, until it starts. I've heard of the soft start and wonder if that would help. Uh, yes, I, I believe that would help. So what the soft start RV is, it, it is a thermistor within this deal that, that will lower the amp ramp up in initial startup. So when your air conditioner starts up, it is going to draw about 45 amps. When we've tested these, we've put several of these on. Look at the videos that are, are um, online what that we have. The, uh, but it does it for just such a real brief time. But what that does is it kind of whacks everything else out inside. And you would think, well, 45 amps, why doesn't it trip the breaker? Because you have a slow trip circuit breakers in those so that it doesn't trip every time you have a little spike in some of the stuff. So that, again, to get back to these gremlins is how, how come sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't in various things. You don't know what all is working in here. You just said, you know, if I turn off this and this and this, the microwave, the water heater, the toaster oven, you know, you don't know when that refrigerator is cycling. You don't know when your water heater is also going to kick on and, and if you're running it in the electric mode. And so all these things could start and stop at different times. But if you take that, R, that soft start RV and you put it onto your air conditioner, that amp, uh, initial amp draw will be about 14 amps. It's that low. So in my opinion, it's a, it's a great product to put on. Uh, it's going to extend the life of your air conditioner, definitely, because your compressor's not going on every time it starts up. And that's how it looks, too. If you ever take the cover off, it goes. So. And it is something you can install yourself. Uh, take a look at the video that we did. You don't have to cut any wires or anything like that. Uh, you're going to just take wires off the existing capacitors that are on your air conditioner. It will come with wires off of the soft start RV, and you just have to crimp on a couple of the right ends that go on to your capacitor. They have a great uh, technical support department that will walk through it with you. They'll send you the diagram, and then they'll walk through it while you're doing it even. So, yes, you can do it. Pauline says, um, and I want to go back up here real quick. I don't see it. Where? Whoa. Okay, so the if you're overspending this summer, check out the Money Saving Secrets Guide on the RV Lifestyle and Repair. I have never, ever been known to do money saving secrets, <laughs> unfortunately. All right, so let me get back down to questions. Um, so Paul, Pauline has a 2013 Jayco Swift um, J Flight 185, the Norcold refrigerator when running on propane, uh, putting smell inside the trailer. Repair shop removed the bees' nests, but the smell still happens. Is it possible that the burning of the bees' nest damaged the inside of the exhaust tube? Their suggestion is do not use and replace with a Dometic. RM, let me guess, they sell the medic. They don't sell Norco. Think of installing this myself. Good idea or, or too hard. Um, so th I, don't think it, I don't think it has anything to do with the bees nest inside the exhaust too because of the, the, the way your um, system works is it's got a burner vessel that has hydrogen, water, ammonia, and sodium chromate in it. So if you're running it off of the propane, you've got a flame down on the side here that heats this solution and it goes up and becomes a vapor and it goes into your evaporator coils first up in the freezer section and then it separates and does a whole bunch of chemical reactions flashes and it draws heat out of both the refrigerator and, and the refri freezer and, and the refrigerator that can run about 300 degrees and so the back side of your refrigerator, now all that's enclosed too. None of that, you know, bees can't get in there, the nest can't get in there. But what it can do, if it got into some place that's going to get really hot like that, 
then um, you know it, it's gonna it's gonna burn and give you a, a burning smell uh, on the inside. It's supposed to exhaust up through the backside, up into the top or the side if your if your refrigerator is in a slide room. So yeah, you could get some smell on the inside of it, but I guess what I'm a little bit concerned on is that if they supposedly removed the bee's nest, did they just remove it from the exterior compartment that you can see through the vent, or did they take the refrigerator out? I would say you probably have some more stuff up and down on the inside of that. And if you're looking at replacing that, you know, if it's working fine, I would say don't replace it. Uh, what I would do is I would pull it out and I would clean the back of those coils really, really good. Um, you know, the nice thing about your refrigerator is that it works on LP or 120 volt power. It doesn't work on, on 12 volt unless you have an inverter um, but in a big battery bank. But if you're looking to replace it with a Dometic that is an AC slash 12 volt unit, um, you know, it, I just, I think it's a waste of money in my opinion. I would pull that out. I would clean that back coil up really, really well, get in that back uh, cavity and find out what's still back there that's causing that. I would, I would think, I would assume that what they did is they just went in and opened the vent, they saw this bee's nest, and they pulled it out. So you probably got more stuff up in there. There's nothing wrong with the Dometic. It's just that it won't run on L LP. So the more you go boondocking, uh, you're going to have to either use an inverter or use the 12 volt uh, section of this, and you're gonna have to have a big, big battery bank. Um, and I don't think it's that hard to do myself. You just have to know, ask yourself, how comfortable do you feel taking a gas line off, reinstalling it safely? Anybody can do it, but safely is the key, right? So Tony says, tell the guy to move to Texas and he won't need his furnace. Okay, there you go. Texas still gets cold once in a while too, though. So uh, Nora says, how does the heat affect bottles of biological toilet treatment? 2020 grand design uh, Imogen. So I would, I would guess you are looking at this kind of stuff or this kind uh that's the only two. Oh, i got the eco toss ins here so the nice thing about you know and, and it, it depends on and you said biological ones so i'm assuming that you're talking about the ones that have no formaldehyde no uh, you know the fragrance the dye all this stuff as an enzyme based type of product, which, which all these do, this is tank blaster. That's a cleaner, but you know, what you're going to get when you have the formaldehydes and, and the type that are non-aerobic uh, type treatment products in there, and the hotter it gets, the more that stuff gets, the, the bad bacteria just thrives and eats on that stuff. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, that's why you smell the rotten egg smell, the sulfur and stuff. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know of any heat um, issues with any of this stuff contains ammonia, um, calcium nitrate, uh, double salt, uh, nothing about heat. And um, that one, pour in waste holding tank prior to using. This one, uh, contains calcium nitrate, non-ionic surf, surfactant. It's for 15 minutes, odor control additive. And there is absolutely nothing in any of this about heat related instances. So again, if you get, if you get the right product, um, it's got the enzyme based, then you're not gonna be affected by heat. And uh, I used one of these well, it's been, it's been actually two years ago now, but um, we went out and shot some video in Death Valley and we had a kind of a circle of camp campers in that. And we used all this stuff and it was about 113, I think, at that point in time. So it was, it was very hot and we had no issues whatsoever. Um, you know, no smells in the stuff. So we were pretty, pretty happy with it. Um, 
endorses things like uh, Liquidfy, and I'm not familiar with Liquidfy in, in that. So um, we are out of questions for today. So if you got any questions, post them. Um, but what I'm going to do is go back because we did have several that were posted last month um, that we didn't get to. And uh, there's a couple really good ones in here that I wanted to, I wanted to talk about. Um, so Felix Castillo has a 2015 Jayco J32. The, both the hot and the cold water smells really bad. How can I fix that? And normally what happens is you've got well water that sits in this stuff and it just, you know, it's going to go bad. It's going to start to get that sulfury smell, that rotten egg smell. Uh, the first thing I would recommend is that when, drain your water heater. And this is a big culprit with that because when you drain your water heater, you still have a couple inches of water and slime and calcium and rust and all that stuff sitting in the bottom of that solidifying and, and getting hot and cold, hot cold every single time you do it. Drain that out, get one of the uh, water heater hoses. Um, you can just hook this to a garden hose and then you can stick it into the, you know, the bottom spot, the drain plug and get in there and just completely irrigate all that stuff out. Now, this one I would be a little careful of um, because I have had a couple people that tell me that this has pulled off. Now, I don't know how that can do that, but this one doesn't, but it has shot out when, when they are doing it and goes inside the water tank. So I would recommend the Campco one, which has got a good screw on fitting here that won't come off. And uh, I am in the process of getting one of those here. I have not gotten it yet, but uh, be careful with this one. But that's the first thing I would do because that's going to clean out that whole bottom area and get it, get all that stuff that's been sitting there probably since that, that RV was first built. Uh, the next thing I would do then is clean out the tanks and both black and gray water tanks. And what I do is I take a quarter cup of bleach and I put it in a gallon jug of water. And then I use one gallon of that for every 15 gallons that I have in, in whatever tank I'm cleaning. So I got my fresh water tank. I'm going to clean that. You know, it could be 45 gallons. It could be 70 gallons. So one gallon of the mixture for every 15 gallons put it in there and fill it up. Uh, I would do that with the gray water, the black water, the fresh water. And you're saying that you got smells in both the hot and cold. And so you want to get that fresh water tank uh, cleaned up, let it set overnight uh, and then run it through everything you got that, that will get all that out. Now, if you don't like the smell of bleach, they do have a bleach that is more of a, um, you know, a less chlorine smell to it, a little fresher smell. The other thing you can do is then um, take gray water, and I don't have it with me, but um, this is a holding tank deodorant. Thetford has a, oh, I know it's upstairs because I took a picture of it. Thetford has a fresh water tank cleaning kit, and it's it's a two-part kit. So you put the, put the first part in. Um, the amount depends on on how much uh, holding, you know, freshwater tank capacity is, and, and then the second one, and then run that through everything. But again, you want to do that after you've cleaned out your your water heater, and then run it through the entire system, and you should be able to get rid of that smell. So let's go down and see if we got any new questions that came in. Rich says, "Yes, that's true. It bleach is like duct tape; it fixes everything." You're right. Um, Mike says, if I store my RV a 2019 reflection in an enclosed garage, is it better to run the fridge while in storage? No, you, you don't want to run the fridge. You just want to clean it out really, really well. There's no moving parts in that. There's nothing that's going to be lubricated. Um, you know, it, you'd have to have either an open propane and run the batteries down or have it plugged in. And, uh, you know, it just, there's, there, it doesn't do any good, um, to that refrigerator, even if it's a, um, 120 residential unit or not, they recommend just cleaning, cleaning it out really good. Um, and you know, there, there's a little bit of both. Uh, some people say to leave the door open. Others say, D don't leave the door open. I know Norcold and Dometic both say shut the door, but close it or clean it really, really well. Use vinegar and water to clean it out, get all the food and everything out of it, and then make sure it's completely dry and then close that refrigerator. 
and, and just leave it closed. That way you don't get any critters in there or, or anything like that. Um, so Pauline says, you said to pull the fridge and clean the coils, et cetera. What do I clean everything with? And I would just, you know, the, the coils on the back of that are going to be a zigzag steel uh, hollow piping that's in there. And you will see uh, the flue running up the side and some, you know, some other coils in there. It's just steel. So I would, I would use a, um, you know, probably just like a, a vinegar and water, um, you know, and, and a real fine steel wool just to kind of go over everything and make sure there, there's no particles of the nest, bird droppings, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Um, you could probably use Dawn dish soap in that too, if there's, you know, some heavy, heavy stuff in it. Um, and then just rinse it all off. It's just the one thing I would really highly recommend, you know, is, is don't, don't spray it all down because you're going to have some electronics down in the module board and places that you don't want to get water and just do a, a real kind of an isolated cleaning, um, you know, that isn't soaking it. It's just cleaning it, wipe it off really good afterwards, and then get a clean towel with water and just keep rinsing it and, and sponging it out and just keep doing that and then let it dry. Um, and that should do it. Uh, fridge one, storage, liquefy. Okay, so let's go back up. And I see Rhonda said, I had a lightning strike. Oh, no, wait a minute. Paul, Pedro is first there. 2017 Bighorn Traveler. The bed slide won't, won't come out. The right side tries to move, but not the left. Oh, the right side tries to move, but not the left side. What would be the problem? Well, the, you, what you probably have, Pedro, is um, a bed slide a lot of time is a Schwintech, especially since you got a 2017. And how you can tell is on the outside of the room, there are there's a rail, bottom and top, and it's just this teeth rail. And so you've got two motors up inside the wall of those rig, and then you've got gears down at the bottom. And these motors turn and they push the room in and out. So the, the motors on the top actually push, the gears down on the bottom help guide it. And so I would say probably either one of those motors is bad, it's got kinked, um, you know, it, it, there's some obstruction to it. So the first thing I would do is I would go out and inspect those rails really, really good, the teeth on those things. It may be if, that you have one of the gears on the bottom has, has broken. There's a little V roller that goes along a guide that could also be misaligned or, or broken. Um, see if you can push the room in and out by itself. Um, Lippert owns Schwintech now. And if you go to lci1.com, they have a whole troubleshooting set on how to go through and, and see what, you know, verify what's happening with this. Uh, a lot of times, if you have a, a Schwintech with a problem like this, you've got a control box in a compartment underneath somewhere by that slide room, and there, there will be a code blinking. It will do like a one or two code and then a wait and it'll do a one through six code and that will tell you motor one or motor two is having a problem and you know you might not have power going to that so it's either power's not getting to that motor that's not moving or the motor's broken or you've got some kind of a you know a jam in that thing and uh, usually what the troubleshooting step is is to get a harness and just bypass everything. Hook a 12 volt up to there, so you know it's a it's the control box, it's the motor. If you try to put that motor up, um, it doesn't go. So go to lci1.com. They have videos. They have great troubleshooting guides. Um, so I would I would suspect that that's that's what it is. Um, but I didn't go far enough. The outlet tripped after all it was repaired. Breaker was replaced. I'm getting an E1 code on the AC. Oh no, that's that's Rhonda. That's Rhonda's having her air conditioner is not working. Okay, so here's Rhonda's. She had a lightning strike near her house and a breaker tripped on my house panel. My trailer was plugged into a 20 amp GFCI outlet just to run the lights and the, humi the dehumidifier. The outlet tripped and after all was repaired, the breaker was in place. I'm getting an E1 code on the AC thermostat. Trailer breakers are all good. How can I reset the thermostat? Well, the first thing I would I would 
caution you is you are not just running the um, lights and the dehumidifier because when you're plugged into 120 volt power, your distribution center and your converter like this is running 13.2 volts all the time. So whatever else is running in there is drawing, uh, you know, on that 20 amp GFCI. And if you are anything else, normally in a house, those are gang to other outlets. So you first thing I would I would recommend is find out is that a is that a, a solo outlet, I mean just dedicated for your travel trailer. If not, make sure you don't have a freezer, refrigerator, air compressor, whatever plugged into that as well. And then um, get get a product. There are um, this is something I like. To, this is called an amwatt a uh, kilowatt. And what this will do is when you are plugged into a source, so you plug this into your garage source, and it tells you I have 121 uh, volts coming out of this. So when I want to find out the amps, then I push the amp button here. Since I got nothing plugged in, I got zero. But then plug your RV into this with a reducer, and it will tell you how many amps you are actually drawing so that you know that that 20 is safe. And I'm not saying it's not, but it's just I've seen it way too many times. That, so, um, and, and this you can get at any home improvement store. It's just called a kilowatt is what that is. And Angie likes it when I do this. My camera lady, she goes, stop that. There's a kilowatt. Um, Okay, so that's the first thing. And then you, if you have an E1 code on the air conditioner, and I don't know, you didn't give me the type of air conditioner. Is it Dometic? Is it uh, Eric Cell Coleman? Um, you didn't give the year either. So, it, you know, it's probably not a Furion. But you should have an owner's manual in there. And I'm not sure what the E1 code is on, on that, but it may be that you have to disconnect everything um, up to the air conditioner as far as the 120 circuit breakers or whatever. So uh, you should be able to find that out. But I can, I can, you know, if you can send me and you, I don't know if you're on because this came in July. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that you need to do is get the owner's manual, look inside, it will tell you exactly what that code is. So then you know, if you have to reset the thermostat or if it's something in the air conditioner that has to happen. The, the, the thing about the thermostat, um, that I think it's actually in the air conditioner is the thermostat runs off a 12 volt power. And if you had a spike, a lightning strike, and you had a spike in your electrical system, it would have been in the 120 side, which would affect the air conditioner, not the thermostat. So take a look at that, but that code should tell you what it is. All right, we're gonna go back down. Whoa. Okay, so Norm says, what can be done about the creaky floor uh, trailer was bought this year? So it, um, you, you didn't give me the make and the model um, of the trailer in the year. So let's assume it's brand new. I would take it back to the dealership. First, I would contact the manufacturing company. Because a lot of times you'll take it back to the dealership and then they'll go, oh, they all do that. Well, they're not all supposed to do that. And, and my concern would be if it's creaking now, you know, that means something's loose. And then what's going to happen three years, five years down the road when it's out of warranty? Um, you know, more than likely, if it's creaking down there, a lot of times it's where the two panels meet and they just, you know, the, the paneling will move back and forth against each other just because it doesn't have quite enough support underneath that. Um, you know, what I typically have done with those is I would go, go underneath and, and if you can, isolate and put some bracing between the two you know just get a, a you know, piece of metal or a, even a piece of wood that you can bridge that and help support that area now same thing with you know like soft floors will have some creaks in them too because they're going to move and you've got a, a metal undercarriage in there that it, it may hit and move it very possibly it's a cracked well you know if you're walking down there and you've got a welded perimeter steel and flooring cross members in it, and you got a you got a weld that's cracked. Um, it's going to creak because it, it doesn't have the support of it. So, it, you know, even if if it's a used unit, I'd still take it back to the dealer 
and uh, maybe do some investigating yourself prior to taking it back if it's out of warranty and just you know um you know i've i've taken a few of these i've got a local welder over here in fact i got a salem we've been working on um and uh we got a couple of loose frame pieces underneath and uh, we're going to take it over to him and he's just going to weld them up and add some bracing to it because the floor is a little soft as as well that the part of the floor we didn't replace <laughs> is soft we had to replace three-fourths of it so that's that that's what i would do rick rich says to piggyback on dave's suggestion i'd recommend getting a good surge uh suppressor to use in line in your power uh have seen some really bad power setups even at really good campgrounds and i'm glad you brought that up rich i was i, I forgot to mention that and i was going to you know this is surge guard um and it will prevent from an oversurging protection i believe it's at like 132 volts and it'll also protect from low voltage so if you've got a campground where you know they've piggybacked a whole bunch of the older units and some of the big boys come in and you got 105 volts is all this is going to shut that down versus ruining your compressor and your in your and motor in your air conditioner and other stuff now the difference you're going to find in these is this is nice because it will tell me uh, what i have for voltage what i have for amp draw uh, it will shut down and it will give me a signal that it did if i'm out sightseeing but it will also turn back on after two minutes once the power is restored because it could be just a, a short period of time but the it, it's a little expensive we're about 300 dollars for this one but it all boils down to how many jewels you have and the more jewels the richer the benditos uh 2450 jewels so what happens is every time this trips then you lose those jewels you know more of those you have the more it will reset the cheaper ones you have to send back in some of them are just done you get a surge they're done and so I highly recommend you, you get a good one. So thank you for that, Rich. Uh, my refrigerator keeps freezing everything. I've tried adjusting the slide thing, but it doesn't help. So uh, again, th the make and model and year of the refrigerator is important. If, if it's a, an absorption refrigerator that runs on LP and 120, then what I always say is try it on LP and you know which which mode is it doing that which are you using it most of the time if you're doing running it on 120 try it on lp and just see if that makes a difference if it still freezes up on lp then uh, i would go back and um and, and you know and, and look at some other things here so here's how the refrigerator works is you've got that rich solution we talked about beforehand when you are plugged into 120 you've got a heating element that heats that solution and runs it up and it turns into a vapor and it goes through the um, the cooling unit fins zigzags in the evaporator in the freezer section and then it goes through the refrigerator section the condenser and makes it way its way back down uh, if you have freezing in there then the first thing I, and, and what tells the refrigerator to start and stop is the thermistor and that's what you're talking about sliding the thermistor up and down so the first thing i look at is is it so it got ice around it. Um, in your case, it wouldn't because the um, um, it, it's too cold. So if it had ice around it, it would it wouldn't cool enough because it thinks it thinks it's cold enough. So I would just test the thermistor. What you do is you take that out, you put it in a cup of ice water, and then you look in your owner's manual and you ohm out that thermistor. That'll tell you, and, and in your owner's manual, it'll tell you what that ohm reading should be because that ice water is simulating 32 degrees right at about freezing. So you put that in there for a few minutes. You test the two probes on the outside. You measure that with what's in the book. I would say you probably got a bad thermistor. It's telling it to turn on, turn on, turn on. And, you know, I know a hundred people that would love to have your problem because most of those have the other problem that it doesn't cool enough. And so that's the first thing that I, I would look at. The second thing I would look at is uh, take a dollar bill and put inside, shut the door and make sure that you got a nice little tug all the way around that refrigerator door. That seal, that gasket needs to seal really good. If it's not, then you're getting warm, moist air in there and it's gonna freeze up a lot faster and it's going to 
think it needs more cooling and it's going to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. So make sure that that door, uh, you know, it's, and it's not uncommon to put heavy items like the milk and stuff in the door. And then when you go down the road, that makes that door sag. So if you got that happening, if you have a fifth wheel or you have a diesel pusher, you're going to need a hundred dollar bill because maintenance is much more expensive on those than just a dollar bill. That's my favorite joke. Um, the other thing then I would look at is air circulation inside, because if you've got the warm, moist air rising to the top and you've got your, your, um, your shelves lined with a lot of food and a lot of tin cans in there, or you got a, a liner in the shelf itself, take that out. You need that air circulation to get that thing rolling and, and going through it. Now I just saw something this morning and I don't remember where I saw it, but I think it's Campco has come out with an evaporator fan. Now, normally you could put a small little, one of those blue nine volt battery powered fans at the bottom and get some air circulation. This guy put it on the back of the evaporator fins inside the refrigerator and it just circulates everything in there. He had some cooling issues, problems with it, but I think that that might help yours. And then one other little trick that um, I've always told people to do is if you're having problems, these are not frost-free refrigerators. You, you will get some, some ice buildup on these, especially in the freezer. Take one of those flexible cutting boards that you, you can buy at any home improvement store in the kitchen section and put it on the, on the bottom and the back. And then when it does you know, start to uh, build up, you just go in there, put a little knife underneath it, and that thing pops all that stuff out. Very easy way to defrost it. Um, okay, Stephen asks, my hydraulic on my 1998 Winnebago Chieftain, it stops, stops, stopped working suddenly. My levers on my slide outs will not work. Absolutely no noise at all made when you're trying to operate them. So your 98 Winnebago Chieftain has an HWH hydraulic system in it, and that runs both the um, slide mechanisms for your slide rooms and your hydraulic leveling systems. And I would imagine you probably have the, um, you said it was a, where's it at? Chieftain. Okay. So most likely you have the controls right off to the driver's side on the floor. You got three levers on there. So you pop the levers back and then you can run that joystick front and back. Your HWH is up in the front. So I know for a fact that with HWH, you have to have the park brake on for them to run and you have to have power. So make sure you got your house battery um, is, is charged up and that's gonna be underneath the steps and you'd, you would have two of those. You, and you hopefully on, a, on about the fifth or sixth set of those batteries from a 1998. So then you have to check power going to the actual motor. And if I remember correctly, the motor in that one, um, now I can't remember for sure. So I can't remember correctly, but you should be able to find the motor by opening up the compartments and you'll just see this main HWH motor. You got to check for 12 volt power to that motor. You've got fuses. Um, you would have one fuse in above, I believe it's your microwave. There's a set of, of uh, white little push button fuses. Those are 12 volt fuses rather than the uh, plug-in automotive ones you see in, in most of the RVs out there. Winnebago had that, that plug-in system with those. Check that to make sure that you've got it. You should also have an inline fuse at the motor itself. That one would be automotive style and check for 12 volt there. If you have 12 volt at that point right in there, then it's most likely your motor. So you got you to check for power going into that. What I would also recommend is go on to winnebago.com, go to the owner's section up on the top tab and it'll come down and we'll have a whole bunch of things that you can look at. It will have... Um, wiring diagrams, it will have 3D diagrams. I doubt 98 will have the good 3D diagrams, um, but you should be able to, to find out where that stuff's at. The other thing I would recommend is call HWH. They are out of Moscow, Iowa, and they are ph phenomenal to work with. They, they really know their stuff and you should be able to get that all taken care of. Um, so Rodney says he's got 2000, 2019 Jayco Seneca. 37K, big super C, um, light on the super. Well, it is kind of. Backsliding door fell down, barely screwed in. Looks like it was installed before the walls closed up. 
How do I put it back up? Um, and I'm, I'm not familiar with how Jayco put the stuff in, um, but normally what happens with those slide rooms is they do put the rail up on the top um, they, and they go from, and it's, it's pretty chintzy framework. It's real small wood framing stapled together most of the time. And then they span that across. And a lot of times they staple that stuff in. You're probably going to have to pull the uh, panel wall off. And I'm not sure if it's on the bedroom slide. You said the back sliding door. So I'm assuming you're talking about the bedroom slide. You're probably going to need to pull that paneling off. It's just in there with some real small brad nails uh, to be able to get, get that and see what happened to that track. Um, sometimes you can, depending on the rail, and again, I don't, I don't know the, the style that they use, but it, it usually is just a grooved rail that the rollers fit in. And sometimes you can go at the very end and there'll be a little set screw that's supposed to keep it in place. But if that loosened up, it would have slid out and you said it fell down. Very, so it's probably the whole frame rail. So I'm pretty sure you're gonna have to pull that paneling apart. I am binge watching all the previous Ask an Expert videos. Almost caught up. Learned a lot. Thank you. You, you should try Justified because that's a lot more fun. It's no. So, okay. We are out of questions here and we got a few minutes left. So I'm going to go back up and see what we got for August. So Ernie, um, asked, would it be a good idea to replace my Norcold refrigerator with a 12 volt refrigerator? And again, we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to bring this one up because, um, you know, again, the Norcold one runs off of LP and 110 volt power. And if you do any amount of boondocking, that LP side is really nice to have. And if you maintain it properly and you clean out the burner assembly and all that stuff, like we showed in many of the videos, it will run very efficiently. I've had several people out there that love them. Now, some people don't like them. They had some issues with them, but I, I could generally trace that down to not maintain, maintaining them properly. If you're going to, and, and if it's working fine, I, I don't know why you'd replace it. Now, the 12 volt refrigerators, if you're going to get one of those, you want to get one with a Dan Foss compressor in it. It's the most efficient one. It runs the best and it will, it will last about three times as long as a residential refrigerator or other one that's running through an inverter going to the batteries. Because with the 12 volt, you're going to have to pull from battery power. So you're going to have to have some pretty good power. You know, you, you want to do two uh, 100 amp hour lithium batteries, you're not going to get much more than a couple days of boondocking on something like that. So you're going to have to have more battery power, solar panels, all that stuff. So um, the, you have to look at how you're using that. So we talked to Peyton. Let me get down to, uh, Rodney says, if I have to take the panel off, I'll have to remove the cabinet in the bedroom or the bathroom. And, and that's very possible. Like I say, Rodney, without being able to see it, um, you know, it, it's hard to tell that cabinet shouldn't be that, that difficult. You open up that cabinet door and you, you can see the mounting points for that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not the easiest to do, but, but, uh, you might, you might have to do that. I, I don't know of any way of getting at that track because normally they're all covered up with paneling. Nobody wants to see that sticking out there. Pauline says, why would the fridge work perfectly on AC and only cool to 45 degrees on propane? So that then, and, and it's a good thing you tried both of them, Pauline, because what's happening there is that it, it, if it's working on AC, it's telling me that the cooling unit's fine. It's not blocked. You don't have any problems with that. And it's working on that 120 volt side of it. So that tells me that either number one, you don't have enough LP pressure to get your flame high enough to, to really boil that stuff in there. Then that could be, be your regulator. Yeah, it could. So the first thing I would do is I would clean out the burner assembly. And how you do that is you get yourself a little blow tube like this. You can get them at home improvement stores. I made this one. It's just a, you know, a, a compressor gun. And I took a quarter inch um, pipe from home improvement store, 
heated it up because it wasn't quite fit and then it popped on there you can see and then i put this little pinch clamp on it so i hooked this up to a compressor go outside open up the back of the vent uh, lid that you can get at, and you'll see the, the the pipe that runs across you'll see the burner assembly in there and uh, um, then it goes into a little steel box in the corner and that steel box is your burner assembly and so what you want to do is take that off if you can um, or kind of bend it back to get in the inside of it and we got several videos on this we show how to do that and what happens is is that first of all that tube that's going in there you've got a an orifice that the gas goes through and it mixes with air and a, there's spiders that love the smell of propane and they'll spin a web in there and they'll block the airflow through that um, you also get dirt and dust and that kind of stuff in it then inside that burner assembly you're gonna get soot and all that insulates and it doesn't allow the heat to get to that that liquid that needs to get in there so clean all that stuff out really really good again we've got videos that show how to do that Wear safety glasses, because if you haven't done it, you're going to get soot running all over the place. Get that stuff all cleaned out, then see if it, if it cools better. If not, then I would go back to the regulator and have somebody do a, a water column test, just to see what kind of pressure am I, am I getting from that. Because again, the gremlins is you're running that refrigerator. What if the water heater starts up while you're doing that? What if you're using the stove? What, you know, there's, there's other things that will draw from that. So you really need to um, you know, isolate that. Yes, I have enough pressure to be able to, um, to take care of that. And then after that, um, you know, again, it's, it's not the cooling unit because it's working on the AC side. So it, it may be that, um, you know, I have seen times where if you have uh, low batteries, so if you're running it on LP, more than likely you're boondocking. And when you're boondocking, you've got all these things that are drawing from the batteries. So the, if the batteries are sulfated, they work for a while and, you know, they're fine. And then all of a sudden they drop to a point that refrigerator will not start unless you have 10.5 volts in there. And so it, it will not, um, you know, won't open that gas valve. So it quits working for a little while. You don't know that because you, know, you don't hear it out there. It doesn't make any noise. You don't know it. And then all of a sudden you plugged in or the solar panels or you know, something else quits working, the batteries kind of go, oh, and they get a little more life to them and then the refrigerator starts up again. So you got this on and off and on and off and and it, and it just doesn't keep up. So I, I would clean all that stuff, try that those things and, and then see if that helps. Okay, Rodney says, thanks. One more, the back of my Seneca is a one piece fiberglass cap top to bottom, the screws in the panel by my generator. I see two screws coming out uh, between the cap and the RV. Um, it, it has spread about a half an inch. How do I get in there and tighten those screws? Man, Rodney, you're killing me. <laughs> I, that one is, um, you know, normally what they do um, when they manufacture, they will put a complete laminated back wall on that unit and then put that fiberglass cap on the backside of it. And I believe your Seneca is, you said a Super C, so the engine will be up in front. You should be able to get access to that somewhere, uh, I, I, would, I would say, um, through one of the compartments on the inside. I don't think there's anything on the back side that allows you to get in there. And you said that uh, the back of my Seneca is a one-piece fiberglass. The screws into the panel by my generator, I see two screws coming out between the cap and the RV. Okay, so that's, that, there, yep, it's spread about half an inch. Man, um, if their generator, you know, I guess I'm just not seeing, you know, where that's at. Basically, you're going to have to see what's on the other side of where those screws are. You see them, and, you know, is there access under the, under the bed? Is there uh, access in one of the compartments through the generator? Do you have to drop the generator? That one, I guess I would, I would call Seneca and just... You know, see if you can get some kind of information from them. So, so, so here Rodney comes back. I know there's no way to get those screws. Okay, yeah, all right. Okay, you're going to cut them. Put new screws from the generator side back in the panel and the fiberglass. There you go. That would work. Okay, so it's actually the water heater, not the generator compartment. But I'm capable of taking out the water heater if I need to. 
And Pauline says, thanks so much. Rich says, Dave, a wealth of inf information. Sometimes I just get lucky, I guess. <laughs> I, for, being in, I tell you what, being in this since 1983, I'm always learning something new. So with that, we are at 5 o'clock. I'm getting the thumbs up here to get going, and I appreciate everybody coming out. Again, if you're anywhere near the Raleigh area, you want to stop in uh, next Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a week from today. We'll be running from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you've got any questions, you're welcome to come in. I will be there the entire length of the show. So with that, I appreciate it. Have a great week, and uh, happy RVing with what's left of the summer. <laughs>